morning. Good morning. Hey, that was great. It is a great and good morning today, and I'm just glad I'm in a cool place. How about you? Mm-hmm. Hey, I am grateful for that. And all of you who are watching online, good morning to you, and I hope you're in a cool and wonderful place as well. As we've come together to worship today, it, it, in this place, not only is it cool, but God is in this place. Agreed? And wherever you're worshiping with us, God is in that place too, because our God is everywhere. He knows what's going on in our lives. He knows what it is that we need. He knows just how to love us. And isn't that just a wonderful kind of feeling? To know that he knows just how to love us. May his love be present with us today as we are present with each other. And may we worship our God together in this time. Let's focus our thoughts now as we prepare to worship. beautiful, Charlotte. Thank you. Would you stand with me and let's go to God in a congregational prayer as we pray out loud together this morning. It'll be on the screen for you. Let's pray together. From all our lives' pathways, you have called us to this place. Oh, Lord, be with us as we listen for your word and seek your ways. Guide our steps and guard our lives that we may serve you more faithfully in this broken world. Amen. Now let's raise our voices together as you are able in song as we sing. Our first song here is not to us, but to your name be the glory, Lord. Here we go. Two, one, and... It's all for you. Here's the chorus part. Not to us, but to your name. Be the glory. Not to us, but to your name. Our hearts unfold before you. 
your throne The only place for those who go It's not for us, it's all for you Send your holy fire Send your holy fire on the suffering Let the worship burn for the world to see It's not for us, it's all for you Come on, oh, glory and honor and praise, our glory and honor and praise, our glory and honor and praise, our glory and honor and praise, not to us, but to your name, be the glory, not to us, but to your name. more song here. It's I Give You My Heart.
Just um, take a moment just to come before God in prayer today. I just invite you that wherever you are and whatever's going on inside of you, just to, as you come before God today, just take your hands and place them out in front of you. You can put them in your lap or hold them up a little bit, but just place your hands out in front of you and just think for a moment. Here, are, here you are before God. We just sang those words, I give you my heart, I give you my soul, I give you my everything. What is it that you bring to God today? God, we bring you today praise and thanksgiving. We bring to you today, oh God, lives that are not perfect, but lives that desire to be with you and to be with each other. We bring to you today some places in life that are a little difficult for us. We bring to you today some hurts. Hurts that we have experienced. Maybe some hurts that we have participated in. We bring to you today concerns that we have for neighbors, for friends, for family members who are in need of healing in whatever form that may take. We, we bring to you today hands that are willing to serve, hands that are, are willing to care and embrace and, and be a part of your work, oh God. But sometimes we don't always get it done. We bring that to you today. But we also bring our willingness, our willingness to love, our willingness to forgive, our willingness to be your messengers in the world, our willingness to be your body in the world. God, all these things we bring to you. Take those that are heavy from us. Take those things that prevent us from knowing you, from following you, from being your people. Lift those things from us. And then God, with our hands still wide open, Pour out your spirit on us. Give us a fullness of your love, a fullness of your grace, a fullness of your forgiveness that we might have hope. And that what is in our hands now, O oh God, no longer weighs us down, but frees us for joyful service to you, frees us to love those around us, frees us for a life of joy and hope. These hands are your hands now, O oh God. Our hearts are your hearts now. Our prayers are your prayer. And our words are your words that your son Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, our Father who art, art in, in heaven, heaven, hallowed, hallowed be, be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will, will be done, done on earth, earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
would like to go out uh, for a children's time that right now that would be great there'll be folks there to meet you and to take you back and you can have a, a good time together in your own message I, I don't know about you but uh, how many of you have caught a glimpse of the Olympic tryouts on TV have you seen any of that kind of stuff you know and oh, oh yes I know it's only tryouts but think about think about how those folks who are <coughs> excuse me competing for that tryout it's not just tryouts for them, right? I mean, this is a big deal. Think about their mamas and papas and how happy they are for this moment and everything that they've done to get to this moment. And, and as they're there and they're competing, I mean, they're each one gifted. They're each one devoted. They've won all kinds of competitions to get them to this place, and they're all better than me. How about you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't have to clap quite so loud on that part. But, but, but they, I mean, they do things that I could never do. How about you? I mean, that kind of synchronized diving? No. First of all, you would have to get me up there. And then it would not be synchronized diving. It would be synchronized pushing as you push me off, right? And, but all of this stuff, you know, just to be on the team to see who gets to go to Paris to compete in the Olympics this summer. For each one of them, they know what success looks like. 
They know in their mind what it means to really succeed, to really achieve, and, and what they have to do to succeed. But what about you and I? What is it that we would say success looks like when it comes to being a follower of Jesus? I mean, what does success look like for the body of Christ, the church, as we follow Jesus? I mean, if the Olympian succeeds, they will go to Paris and, and they will win the Olympic gold. Oh, oh, some of them, some of them, they, they might think that success looks like getting any medal at all. For some of them, they might even think that success is just, I got to go to the Olympics. For some, success might look just like I tried out for the Olympics. But it really depends for them what, you know, what was their goal, Right? I mean, success looks like what it was it that they were trying to achieve. So again, I ask you this. What does success look like for the church, the body of Christ? If, if the church it was a, a team sport, if the church was our sport that we've been recruited for by Jesus to be a part of, what would winning look like? What is it that we as a church are supposed to do to win? When it comes to being a follower of Jesus, the body of Christ in the world, what is that supposed to look like? Well, for some people, it, it's a win if you belong to a church that takes care of you. If the church is just always there for you. You know, and, and they're always going to be there for you, and they're going to be there whenever you have a funeral. You know, I know some churches that are refusing to, to close, even though there's only four or five of them now, because they want to be buried out of that church. That's their goal. You know, I consulted in one church. The building was in, eh, but they had a brand new parking lot. And a double wide sidewalk that led from the church's front door to the cemetery. And the shelter house was in the cemetery, not in the church playground. What did winning look like for them? Do you hear me? Hmm. For some, you know, um, it, it's a place to come and, <coughs> excuse me, and worship the way they like. You know, this is my church. We sing songs there that I know and like. This is my church. This is my pew. This is where I am known and like. This is, you know, th that's, they have a potluck every now and then. They, they serve the people they want to serve. I, I know churches like that. And they think that that's what winning looks like. I mean, for other churches, they think that they have to grow and they have to have lots of ministries and they have to have lots of people and, and that they have to have the biggest of this and the best of that and, and all of those things. And if when they do that, then they have met their goal, they have achieved success. They have achieved their expectations. Other people would just say, you know, a, a church succeeds when they're like family and they just care for one another's. Some would say that it's just having dynamic worship. Some would say it's having a great preacher. Some would say you're supposed to applaud on that one. Some would say, you know, <laughs> that we train people in personal care and, and we meet the needs of people who are hurting. And if we do all of these things, then we would win. We would be successful. But I just want to ask you, what did Jesus say? I mean, after all, the last time I kind of checked, we were supposed to be the body of Christ. We are supposed to be Jesus in the world. We were supposed to be his plan for having a team in the world, playing on Team Jesus. And, and so it might be good to kind of think, what was it that he said the game was? And what was it that he said it would look like if we were to win? I mean, Jesus is the one who defines a scorecard, amen? He's, and he's pretty clear about it. 
After he has been crucified and died and has been resurrected, he returns to his disciples and he gives them this little final bit of insight, lest any of them be confused. All right? Because you would have thought that he'd been with them three years. They were pretty crystal, crystal clear on the plan at this point. But they were a little shaky. And so it wasn't quite as clear as he had hoped. And so he wants them to be pretty clear that the church is to call to preach, to reach the world for him, one person at a time. In other words, we were all to participate in the mission to make disciples. Now here's what Jesus does and says in Matthew 28, beginning in verse 16. These are familiar words to us, but... I just want us to be as clear today as they were then. Does that make sense? And it comes from the message version. It says, meanwhile, the 11, there's only 11 now because Judas is gone. The 11 disciples were on their way to Galilee, headed for the mountain Jesus had set for their reunion. And the moment they saw him, they worshiped. Some, though, held back. Not sure about worship about risking themselves totally. I would say that doesn't miss the mark too much on how we come to church some days, right? I, I mean, has there ever been a moment when you just wanted to say amen or raise your hand or, or even clap and, and, you were, and you thought, well, what will somebody do? What will somebody say? Has there ever been a moment when you just wanted to say, stop for a minute, I need to pray longer? Well, what would somebody say? Has there ever been a moment when you just really wanted to sing really out loud, but you knew you couldn't carry a tune, so you just stood kind of quiet? <laughs> yeah, I knew I'd get to one sooner or later. <clears throat> they were holding back a little. But Jesus, undeterred, he goes right ahead and he gave them his charge. He says, God authorized me and commanded me to commission you. Go out and train everyone you meet far and near in this way of life, making them by baptism in the threefold name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Marking them, rather, excuse me. Then instruct them in the practice of all that I have commanded you. And I will be with you as you do this day after day after day, right up to the end of the age. Now, if we were to go back and let's kind of look at that verse, we would, we would notice that there are four things that Jesus instructs them to do. And the first one is to go. Don't stay here. Don't just think about, about it. Go and do something. Do something. Just go from this place. And then, as you're going, make disciples. Train them in this new way of life. And, and how are you to do this? Well, you would do it by beginning and baptize them. Bring them into the body of Christ. Welcome them into a new way of living. Welcome them into the family. Allow them to have their lives marked as my children. And don't stop there. Teach them. Teach them this new way of life. Teach them everything that I have commanded you and shown you. And instruct them in the practice of all these things. Go do it. Now, to make sure that they understood he was done, he ascended right after that. <laughs> right? So this was not up for debate. This wasn't up, well, Jesus, how do we, what should we really, or what do you think about? No, he's done. This is it. This is the last word. Go, make disciples, baptize, and teach. Now, if we're a follower of Jesus, we only have one thing to do as the body of Christ in this world. Make disciples. That, that, that's we, all we have to do as a church is make disciples. Now, we may make them differently. We may share that good news differently. We may worship differently. I, I mean, can you just imagine the number of different ways that God's people, the church, worship today? 
You know, I think that our Catholic brothers and sisters are worshiping different than we are right now. What do you think? I'm pretty certain that Antioch Southern Baptist Church is worshiping different than we are. What do you think? I, I'm pretty sure that all across Harrisonville, none of us are having the same worship experience. What do you believe? But I'm pretty certain it's the same God. How about you? I'm very certain it's the same Jesus. I'm very certain it's the same spirit that's present. And I'm very certain that we're all a part of the same body. Now that may shock some of them. So don't go tell them. <laughs> okay? As our bishop reminded us a couple of weeks ago, that's why when Jesus said there are many rooms, it's so we don't know each other's there. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it, it's because it might be too much. But this, this is what Jesus designed for the church. This is the way that Jesus lived his life. This is the way he, he encouraged people to be a part of it. This is what led up to his death. And, and, and as he's leading up to that moment, he knows it's not going to be easy. He knows that we're going to struggle with it from time to time. And he knows that we're going to forget from time to time. And he knows that we're going to be kind of under duress from time to time. And so on, on the night when he's about to be arrested, he takes them out to the Garden of Gethsemane. And, and there in the Garden of Gethsemane, he is praying there. He He's invited them to pray, but they fall asleep. And so he prays for them. Now, this is, this is like one of my favorite passages in the Bible, in the Gospel of John, where Jesus is praying this prayer for all of the disciples and all of those who would come after him, after them to become disciples, everyone who would believe in his name. So guess what? That means on the night before Jesus died, he prayed a prayer for me and he prayed a prayer for you. Now, I think that is an awesome kind of thing. How about you? That Jesus knew me before I was ever born and prayed for me. And didn't just pray a little bitty prayer. Prayed a great big prayer for me. Because he knew that I'd need it. I, I mean, do you ever think about needing Jesus to pray for you? I need him. How about you? You know, and I, as I think about those days and I think about all the things that he could have done and all the things that he was supposed to complete, you know, he prays this prayer. And in the midst of this prayer that he is praying, he talks about what it was that he was sent here to do, and he talks about how he has now completed it. Hear this prayer. Jesus said these things, then raising his eyes in prayer, he said, Father, it's time. Display the bright splendor of your son, so the son in turn may show your bright splendor. You have put him in charge of everything human so he might have real and eternal life to all in his care. And this is the real and eternal life, that they know you, the one and only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. I glorified you on earth, but by completing down to the last detail what you assigned me to do. Do you hear that? I've completed down to the last detail what you assigned me to do, God. And now, Father, glorify me with your very own splendor, the very splendor I had in your presence before there was a world. Now, here's what you assigned me to do. I spelled out your character in detail to the men and women you gave me. They were yours in the first place, then you gave them to me, and they have now done what you said. They now they know now beyond the shadow of a doubt that everything you gave me is firsthand from you. For the message you gave me, I gave to them. And they took it and were convinced that I came from you. They believe that you sent me. And I pray for them. I'm not praying for the God-rejecting world, but for those you gave me, for they are yours by right. Everything is yours, mine is yours, and yours mine. And my life is on display in them. For I'm no longer going to be visible in the world. 
They'll continue in the world while I return to you. Holy Father, guard them as they pursue this life that you conferred as a gift through me. So they can be one heart and mind as we are one heart and mind. And as long as I was with them, I guarded them in the pursuit of life you gave through me. I even posted a lookout and not one of them got away except the rebel bent on destruction. The exception that proved the rule of scripture. Now, now did you catch that? Jesus is saying, you gave me a task, God, and I have completed it. What is it in this prayer that Jesus said that he has come to do? It isn't that he said, I've come to heal people and I did it. He didn't say that, did he? He didn't say, I've come to die on a cross and I've done it. Nope. That wasn't, what he was, that wasn't the task that God had given him to do there. He didn't say, I've come to reform worship and make all those Jewish folks come back to you, God. Nope, didn't say that either. No, no, in all these things, what he really says is this. He says, I made 12 men into mature disciples. Now, now go back through that passage. You can read it again on your own time. What it says is that he completed was, was that he taught them everything that you wanted me to teach them. I've shown them the way that you wanted them to know. I've brought them back into your presence. I've revealed your glory to all of them. I mean, isn't that what he said? He had come and he had completed. Help me out here. That's what he said he had come and he had completed. He had completed the task of making disciples. So it was okay now that he left the world because there was somebody still in the world to continue the task. Whoa. That's why he came. His time on earth was not completed. Now, now, he had some other task, but his time on earth wasn't completed until he had someone to continue his work. The good news of Jesus Christ, the good news of God's love for us, the good news of God's forgiveness, the good news of hope and healing, the good news of grace, the message needs a messenger. Agreed? Now here's the thing that we really should know and and in some ways we we might even be a little frightened about, but, but here's the thing. The message of the good news of Jesus Christ is just one generation away from not existing. Think about that. Because how did you and I come to believe? Someone told us. And how did that person come to believe? Help me out. Someone told them. And how did that person come to believe? And so it went all the way back to Peter, James, John, Matthew, Lou. I mean, right? All the way back to those 12 people, 11 of them passed, one didn't, to those 12 people that Jesus made as disciples, it goes all the way back to them is how we came to believe here. One generation at a time, one person at a time, one messenger at a time. The message needs a messenger. Well, you could say, you know, but they got the Bible. They can read the Bible. Have you ever tried to just read the Bible and understand it all by yourself? All right? Or is it a little better reading the Bible and, and having someone else who's kind of reading the Bible and maybe even who has studied it a little bit longer, who has walked it a little bit longer, who has lived it a little bit longer, speak with you about it? Right? Well, but God sent his spirit. His spirit could do all the work. I'll agree with that. But here's here's something. Who did God send his spirit upon? Other people. Right? God chooses to have his Holy Spirit be poured out upon other people. 
people that they might be messengers of his message. God chooses to pour out his love and his grace and his hope and his forgiveness upon other people that they might be messengers of this message. Here's the reality, you know, when, when someone passes away, they still continue to live on, but who do they live on through? Uh, no, 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 this is, don't get that tricky. Okay? When my grandparents passed away, I, I would tell you that their love is just as real today as it was then. Who's the one that lives that love now? The folks who received it, correct? And their love will continue as I love other people. Agreed? This is, this is what is really happening here. You know, what we are... What we become convicted of, what we become passionate about, what we, uh, who we are in our essence, if that is filled with the Holy Spirit, then that is what continues to live on after us. If you were to spend time praying the prayer that Jesus prayed in John 17 and picturing that you were saying to God, I have completed my work that you have given me to do, what would that work be right now? What would it look like? As you're going through life and as you're living in this world, if you're thinking about the task that God has given you to do and Jesus is saying to you, what, what, what would that look like? It would hopefully be, well, I've made disciples along the way, right? To be making disciples as you go. Jesus says, go. But as you go, make some disciples. As you go, lift up Jesus. As you go, Lift up God as you go. Show what love and grace look like. As you go to work, make that known. As you live in your family, make that known. As you live as a neighbor, make that known. As you're sitting at a soccer game, watching little kids just kick each other, make it known. <laughs> right? You're there with those other grandparents. You're there with those other moms and dads. You're there with those other neighborhood kids. Make it known what Jesus does. You know, the other, the other day I, I, uh, I uh, came upon a guy and he was, he was just sitting in his truck and he was just in tears and, and life was just too much. And, and so we just started having conversation. And, and his comment to me was, he says, well, I don't need to tell you all about my life. No one wants to hear all about my life. And I just said to him, you do know what I do for a living. <laughs> God cares. Just make it known. As you go about everyday life, you know, we're not all called to be extraordinary saints. We're just called that as we go, go in the name of Jesus. As you go, love in the name of Jesus. As you go, be Christ in the world. Because remember this, you are part of God's team. This is a team sport life is. Jesus invited you to be a part of that team. He taught you the rules of the game. He showed you how to play the game. He shows you what it looks like to be on team God. He showed us that. He showed us that Christianity is indeed a team sport. And it takes all of us, all of us together in this body of Christ. All of us using the different gifts that we have to be the whole body of Christ. Many gifts, many different parts but the same spirit and the same body. Amen? On this team, everybody plays. On God's team, everybody counts. You know, I was getting that picture of kids playing soccer. If you ever watch kids begin to learn how to play soccer, whoo, Denise and I went and we saw our oldest. He didn't want to play soccer. You know, and... Uh, he would sit and pick the stuff out while they were trying to do drills. And they would try to get him to kick or play. And, and even when they finally decided to skirmish a little bit, I don't know what he was doing. And, and, but if you looked over and saw the rest of them, they were just kicking anything that moved. 
Maybe it was the ball. Maybe it was each other. Maybe it was just the air. But they, they were having a great time, you know. Everybody was playing, and it was wonderful. But somewhere along the way, there are some players that begin to get a little bit better. Agreed? And there are some players that begin to stand out, and there are some players that begin to catch on that, oh, there's a game here. And, and, and then the coach begins to pay a little more attention to those players, right? And, 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 as the, and it goes on, then some of those players even get pretty good, and, and they get to be the starters of the team, right? And then, and then as it goes along, you know, some of them even get to be play maybe in college. Maybe some of them even make it to be professional along the way. But, but here's, here's the deal. You're on God's team. And there are no participation trophies. There are no bench warmers. You all get to play. And you all get paid the same. Grace, love, hope, forgiveness, and peace. And you were all bought with the same price. His name was Jesus. And everybody, everybody is important on God's team. You may never get the ball your job may just be to encourage someone who has the ball. Your job may just be to yell out a play. Your job may be just to pray for the folks who are doing other things. That's no small job. Your job may be the gift of generosity, of just giving in such a way that others can do other greater things on God's team. But that is an important part as well. On God's team, there are just no bench warmers. Everyone is an all-star, and everyone matters. You know, as I was talking with that person, I was realizing that um, what he really needed was not something that I had to give. And it began to just be heavy on my heart that I just began to think, you know, what he really needs is a recovery group. He didn't need me. He needed some of those folks that meet down in our gym once a week that know his story, that have lived his story, and know the way out of that story. So my job was to tell him about that group. My job was to encourage him to become a part of that group. My job was to pray for him and to pray that someone would cross his path that would be that person. Do you hear? Because what Jesus tells us is, is this, follow Jesus, not me. It's not my church. This is Jesus' church. Amen? Amen? It's not, it's not my vision, it's his vision. It's not my favorite music, it's the music that praises him. It's, so don't follow me, don't do what I do because I've made enough mistakes all on my own and you have too, you just don't need mine. But follow Jesus because when I decided to follow him, it made all the difference in the world. How about for some of you? When I made him my priority and not striving to shine on my own, it made all the difference in the world. Because my relationship with him, my relationship with God through him, and my relationship through the Holy Spirit has changed everything. Because God is a relational God. And God wants a relationship with you. God wants you on his team. He wants a relationship with you. He calls you to be his disciple into the world. God intends for us to be in that life with him. So here's the question. Are you in the game? Or are you sitting in the stands? Or did you even show up at the park? 
I want to be on his team. How about you? So go. Go. Make disciples. Baptize them. Teach them to be a part of God's team. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for the call that you place in our lives and the people that you put in our hearts and our lives that remind us, that remind us that each one of us is important to you. Each one of us in our stories has a place in your story. You can use each one of us in that kind of way to make disciples. So as we go about life today, O oh God, use us in that kind of way. As we go about being your body in the world, remind us that you are in us wanting to live through us. And may all this be for your honor and your glory, O oh God, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as you're able, and let's uh, sing this song of response together. Let's go make all disciples. Go make up all disciples, we hear the call that comes from thee, our Father, into the eternal word. Inspire our ways of learning through earnest, fervent prayer, and let our daily living reveal thee everywhere. Go disciples baptizing in the name of Father, Son, and Spirit from age to age the same. We call each new disciple to follow Thee, O Lord, redeeming soul and Disciples, we at thy feet would stay until each life's vocation accents thy holy way. We cultivate the nature God plants in every heart, revealing in our the master's teacher's art. Go make of all disciples, we welcome thy command. No, I am with you always, we take thy guiding hand. The task looms large before us, we follow without fear in heaven and earth thy power shall bring god's kingdom here please be seated this morning as we come to a time of offering it's a time when we can offer our gifts it's a time where we can say god i am here i give you all that i am and all that i have Use me for whatever you wish. May the gifts that we bring today, may our lives that we offer today bring God glory and honor. Let us make an offering.
Gracious God, accept these gifts, accept our lives, accept our worship in this day. Use it all for your honor, for your glory, for we love you, O oh God. We do this in your Son's name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to be seated for just a moment. We've got a couple of ministry kind of moments. I'm going to ask these young ladies in the back to come up right now. Um, one of the things that has been a part of our church family kind of tradition for several years, and for some reason or other, we kind of missed a beat or two. Come right up here and stand by me. Get up there nice and tall. Look out. They're not going to bite you or anything. They're good people. Okay, now, uh, is that we have had opportunities to present to our third graders um, Bibles, Bibles that don't just hang in there with me, Bibles that would... Uh, um, allow them to grow and to know and to grow as the followers of Jesus. Now, our dilemma is we skipped a little bit. And so these two ladies uh, have opportunity today to receive their Bibles. So Leah, I'm going to give you yours. And Madeline, I'm going to give you yours. And uh, these uh, are our gifts to you. But more importantly, this is God's gift to you. Inside is not just a story about God. It's not just a story about Jesus. It's more than a story. It's true. And as you read that, you're going to hear and learn things about who God is to you, who Jesus is to you, what they've done for you, what they're doing in you. And what ends up happening is, is that the story that is in there becomes your story. It's all of our story. And so if you want to know who you are, it's there. If you want to know whose you are, it's there. If you want to know how much God loves you, it is there. So we pray today that you receive those, you use them, don't just put them on a shelf, all right, and that you discover who God is to you, all right? Would you just extend your hands as we pray for these two young ladies? Right, no, wait, wait, applause. This we're going to pray first. Gracious and holy God, we ask you just to be with Leah and Madeline as they receive this gift of truth, this gift of your word. We pray that it might indeed become their stories, that they might find themselves always in your love and always in your care. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now you can clap for these two. Okay. Our uh, second ministry kind of moment is a hot one. Uh, we uh, had a smoking for Jesus in the park yesterday, uh, but there were a lot of people from this church that were a part of that effort. So if you helped serve, if you helped uh, lead games, if you helped cook meat, would you just kind of stand up for a minute? Just everybody that helped, stand up for a minute. Yeah, give these folks a round, would you? They were very helpful. It's a great day. All right, so you can kind of sit down. All right, uh, so, but. This guy right over here, this is the man, all right? Uh, Charles over here, uh, none of the rest of us, uh, we didn't know what it was like to smoke meat, 1,500 pounds of meat, uh, but he did, and, uh, and he helped us do that, and Gary back there in the back, uh, he led the other effort, so we had two smoking crews, we had um, um, Gator Pit. Uh, he, and we had the holy smokers uh, that, uh, and, and then uh, Don and Stephen and I, uh, we were just the sous chefs. And, uh, and uh, it was a hot one, but let me just, you need to give these guys thanks. They did marvelous in getting all that prepared. And, and we even won a few trophies. So if you want to ooh and awe, they're on the table outside, and you can see those. But, but it was a great time. We, we truly had a good time, but um, thank you for your support of that event, and thank you for everybody who came out to be a part of it. It was a great day. So I'm going to invite you to sit, stand. We're going to sing uh, a song, and then we're going to prepare to go out. Let's stand together. It's hymn number 557, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred might is like to that above. Before our
there are a lot of things going on this week here at the church. Um, today, right after this service, you go grab a cup of coffee, come back in. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about what the General Conference of the United Methodist Church and our annual conference have kind of decided. There are some things that make uh, the way we live our lives are going to be very different, and so I do want to share those thoughts with you. Uh, but also then this weekend is the Social Justice uh, Seminar that's going to be hosted by the United Women in Faith. If you want to know more about that, it's going to be fantastic. That's all I can tell you, and you need to sign up. And men and women are invited to be a part of it, so uh, you can see Alice for more details if you want. We have Shepherd's Food Pantry that's going to be happening on July 5th, the day after the 4th. So if you're still in town, down. Still have all your fingers. Come help serve. Barb needs you. I need you. And, and so you can sign up and be a part of that. That would just be great. So now take all those fingers right now and extend them to someone else and say, I'm glad you're here. Would you do that? It has been good to be here together. It is good to know that we are not alone in this world. It is good to know that we are a part of God's family. We are a part of God's team. We may all be different, but we are all called to be God's messengers. So go. Do something. In the name of Jesus, amen. Ha, ha, ha. 